I just wanted to show you this picture from last week. You remember I was talking about those, um, the tombs of the nobles, which are halfway between the rulers and the lower orders, which to a certain extent mark this in-between stage between houses and tombs by having a house on top. Uh, and this is an example of it. I thought it was rather amusing. I found it on the web. Uh, it was picked up by, uh, it was put there by a tourist. Uh, and she put a commentary, I've taken it off, but which says, you think that's a house, ha ha, it's really a tomb. But to a certain extent, that ambiguity is exactly what I was talking about. So, in the last lecture, I discussed the way uh, centralized uh, states centralize the transcendental from local um, communities uh, to represent themselves as though they were one great community uh, and as though they could be imagined in as an organic whole which, like the transcendental, even for ordinary communities, has this extraordinary capacity of lasting in time, while our existence, of course, is continually fluid and has no permanence, um, or, in, or in a sense only has a present. While I, I discussed how this construction uh, of an apparent time attack, a, a kind of freezing of time, uh, is possible. Um, and of course, it's quite obvious why this would be so attractive to any political power to re-represent re itself in a transcendental way as a permanent time-defying entity, um, as a holistic, organic, time-defying time entity as though it was one large, big family where everybody has their place. Where the, um, obviously, with the ruler at the top, but much more important is the point of everybody having their place. The ruler is not separate from, from, uh, from, uh, from the other members of the, of the kingdom uh, any more than, than wives and children are separate from the father of a traditional family. Hence, intermediate uh, groups such as these being in between, being part of that total, uh, of that total organic time negating totality. But um, there's, a further, uh, uh, there's a further reason, or if you like, a further element. Which, uh, which I want to discuss today, as I think it explains how religion comes to how religion becomes a thing separate from the social process. And I think we need to sort of think again, perhaps with Dumont, about the nature of what he calls a holistic hierarchical system, which is. Uh, I believe, like he does, the default form of social organization, while sort of egalitarian social organizations are, if you like, a historical oddity uh, located to only a few places uh, and having a very, very short history. And the element I want to stress is the element of submission of disappearing in the totality. I pointed out how the imaginary, because of course it is an imaginary uh, construction, is given phenomenological reality to a certain extent by the material, the houses, the tombs, and of course the scepters, the grandeur of any kind of kingdom and so on. But perhaps, above all, by ritual. And if you remember uh, what I was arguing in an earlier lecture, I was 
characterizing ritual by the term deference. What I was referring to when I was talking about deference is um, the way in a ritual one doesn't really own one's own actions or own the, the intention behind one's own, the creative intention behind one's own action. One doesn't really own the, inten the, the creative intention behind one's own words. Um, that indeed was what is, is what characterizes ritual. One trusts other people. And one is, to a certain extent, repeating what they have done, saying what they have said. One, if you like, leans on the creativity of others who are trusted. Um, and of course, it's, it's very often a kind of endless regress, because the people one is leaning on, who one is trusting, who one is deferring to, are trusting others, and this may sort of disappear into the, into the uh, mists of time. And this endless regress is one of the major mechanisms by which an anti-time construction, uh, a, a construction which negates the fluidity, the impermanence, which is our nature as organic beings, and indeed the, the fluidity of our social systems, how that imagination is give, given reality. Now, the word deference can be used in this technical and philosophical sense, but in normal English usage, it has also the element of respect or of respect of another person who is recognized to be superior. Of course, this goes inevitably with the idea of trust. If you trust somebody else and you abandon your own creativity uh, to the creativity of others who are abandoning the, the creativity of, of others, you're putting yourself in a hierarchical system. In a, you're placing yourself through your own abandonment into a hierarchical system, which can be imagined as systematic, though probably it isn't, and which can be imagined as having beaten the fluidity of uh, our existence. But involved in this is therefore respect or deference to seniors. It's easier for us to understand it if you think of the, the traditional notion of the family, the conservative notion of the family, where there's the idea of everybody having their role, that they're all but uh, in a hierarchical system, but where the hierarchy is exactly the opposite of inequality. Why is it the opposite of inequality? And of course, that's the point that Dumont is making, that um, because you always own it, however low you are in the system. You know, you may be the youngest child in a family, but it's still your family, uh, as opposed to uh, the notion of inequality as would be given in a Western kind of ideology, uh, which, as I pointed out, is why so much of Western uh, rhetoric appears immoral and difficult to handle in other cultures. But it includes in it this deference, this surrendering of oneself, sometimes completely dramatic, as in, for example, a circumcision a ceremony where the child or at least the child's parents, allows it to be killed in order to be placed back into this hierarchical uh, deferring system. 
And the two points which are interesting in stressing this. One of them is that if you think of the bodily postures of both religion and traditional policies, politics, you'll immediately be struck that they're exactly the same. Indeed, you know, you're, you're, if you're wandering around in a, place, in a place you don't know anything about, and you start to see people bowing down, lowering their body, or kneeling, or putting their hands in supplication together, or even lying flat, avoiding gaze, um, all kinds of bodily movements, you'll think this is religion, probably. Uh, a very sort of naive kind of thing. But of course, these are exactly the gestures that you'd see uh, when people behave towards superiors in a, in a kingdom, a kind of organic kind of totality. So if you like, one can use this kind of uh, physiological element as a support to the argument that I've been making that in fact you're we're dealing with the same thing. But also, and I shall come back to this later in this lecture, this element, um, this element uh, may be the explanation of why this placing oneself in a hierarchy is so attractive. Placing oneself uh, in a position of physical inferiority as part of an organic time-defying totality. One of the uh, physical manifestations of um, these bodily postures, which I didn't mention, but I'll, I'll mention it now because I'm going to come back to it in a moment, is of course carrying something for an older person. Now, something which always strike, uh, is always very striking if you're in a place like Madagascar, and which many people find shocking. That if I'm going around uh, on a walk in the, in the, in the Zephyr village, accompanied by a five-year-old who has difficulty in walking, he must carry my luggage. It doesn't matter. It's absolutely essential. So this carrying of the burden, uh, the physical burden, uh, is also part of this business of kneeling, of, um, of um, bowing, and so on. Again, one interesting side of the aspect of this is that if you look at primate behavior, you see exactly the same gestures. Kneeling, bowing, uh, lying flat, avoiding gaze. You don't see the carrying of birds. So. Right. So all this is to make you think more deeply, and I think we need to think ever more deeply, about what it means to be in a holistic, time-negating, organic totality. And the attempt by kingdom to appropriate this. Of course, it's very nice as an organization of kingdoms, although it does run into a difficulty uh, that kingdoms, uh, in practical terms, in transactional terms, tend to be a ruling class and subjects, while the, the organic representation of the kingdom is of a continual hierarchy with everybody having a position into a totality. Uh, remember, you know, that Dumont was arguing this uh, when he was talking about the Indian caste system and complaining at the misunderstanding of so many sociologists uh, who were seeing the caste system as a kind of extreme form of class. And Dumont quite rightly stressed how misleading that is because it completely misses this totality of deferral and time negation where everybody has a place within the system. 
course, apart from the untouchables, but um, they're not in the system. Um, and the same could be true, actually, among the mariner of the slaves. Um, so let's now go back to this appropriation by kingdoms of um, the organic organicity of the smaller groups. Um, and something I already mentioned last week is the problems uh, this raises. It isn't quite as smooth as rulers would like to make it. The, actually, it's not quite so easy to convince a whole society that they're one big happy family. Though this is, of course, what is always being attempted. Part of the problem, as I, as I pointed out last week, is that the ownership of the totality by those in the lower ranks of the hierarchy is not com completely convincing. All right, if you're a child in a Zephimaniri family or in a 19th century German family, I suspect, your low position is in no way one of inequality in the sense that you are you may be low in, this, in, the, in, the, in, the orga in the organism, but the organism is your organism of which you are a part. This becomes less clear, and, you know, if you look very closely at the history of kingdoms, you'll see that this is continually challenged. But much more important um, is um, the fact that the very timelessness of the, trans, uh, 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 of, uh, of the transcendental construction means it is going to be out of sync with the political. The political, like all the transactional, is in a state of continual change. Uh, there's absolutely no permanence to any political uh, level, to any political uh, unit. Um, and that has to, is, to a certain extent, out of sync with the, the permanence of the transcendental. We could even, you, know, you could even sort of see this uh, in the awkwardness of Mrs. Merkel at the football game. Uh, in a sense, there's a, a, a problem of disconnection there. Because, of course, the construction of the football game is about a, 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 as close as we get to a transcendental con construction a timeless constru transcendental construction of the German nation. But how are you going to stick this to Mrs. Merkel? Uh, she doesn't quite know what to do because she's aware of the disconnection that I'm talking about. So there is a, an inevitable con disconnection which comes from the different time uh, regimes of these two levels. And of course it becomes extreme when the political, when the state collapses and states continually collapse. States absolutely have no permanence. I already mentioned an, an example of this when, um, when the Mariner state lost legitimacy and when the population came back, to, came to the, came to the to, to, to the capital, possessed by the earlier rulers uh, to overthrow the present ruler. This is indeed what happened. He was killed uh, in a statewide possession by what one might call the religion against the state. This is the kind of thing that we can uh, sort of see uh, occurring. And of course, this is, uh, and one of the interesting things, and that's why I put in the stuff about carrying burdens, is what were these people doing? They were carrying on their heads the baggage of the dead queen, that symbol of submission and of 
deference within the system was the one that was chosen. There are lots of very good descriptions of this because there was a time when, when, Madagascar, when the capital of Madagascar was full of missionaries. So we know exactly what it was like. And there were coming from all the roads around these people carrying the burdens of the queen. No better way of recreating the top of an organic hierarchical structure than through those kinds of bodily positions. It's also interesting for the, when one thinks of the Abrahamic religions, which inevitably interests us. Because many theologians have argued that the time when Judaism developed as a monotheistic religion was following the collapse of um, the Jewish state at the hand of the Babylonians. And that it is, it's during the Babylonian exile that the great theological texts about God and about the submission to God, because the Old Testament is all about submission and deference, um, developed, and which, of course, were carried out, carried on in uh, Christ Christianity and Islam. Next week, I'll be talking about Christianity, both modern, both contemporary Christianity and the beginnings of Christianity. So, in a sense, very similar kind of mechanism as what was happening at this period of possession uh, in Madagascar. Indeed, uh, when I'm being cheeky, I sometimes wonder if the Catholic Church is not something rather like that. The Catholic Church, I mean, it's a complicated thing because, of course, Christianity was recuperated by Rome at the period when Rome was in a state of collapse, um, or nearing collapse, very soon to, to have collapse, uh, to be uh, historically accurate. Um, and, of course, so, in a sense, it was a foreign religion that was taking on, but very rapidly, Rome, um, Constantine, and his successors tried to make Christianity a kind of state religion. Couldn't do it all that well, because, of course, the political was in a state of collapse. And what was left was in a sense, the transcendental state without its political uh, basis. Um, it's very striking to me that if you look, of course, at the administrative structure of the Roman Empire and the administrative structure of the um, Catholic Church with a few modifications, at least I'm talking about Europe, of course, uh, you'll see that it more or less corresponds. You know, the, I mean, it had to be modified through time. But by and large, you know, the archbishoprics were sort of big, so big centers, the bishoprics and so on. This was uh, the, very no, the very notion of city, by the way, uh, is very much linked with this. Um, and subsequent history of Catholicism uh, is a kind of chase between the transcendental state having gone loose and political states trying to take it over. There's a kind of, what gets established when you get this collapse of the state is a kind of uh, hide and seek game between religions looking for states and states looking for religion, which is more or less what has been going on uh, at least for the last 200 years in Europe, but in fact in lots of other places lots of other times, and also in the Islamic uh, world. Uh, in many ways, the, the, the great, uh, the divine kings of Africa, which somebody like Evans Pritchard called, you know, 
reigned but did not rule, which are usually the leftovers of collapsed kingdoms, which carry on, uh, which carry on after the collapse of the political, uh, would be examples of this. In many ways, the grand pomp of uh, the Balinese state described by Gertz in Nagara is very much the transcendental state continuing after uh, the colonial uh, uh, breakup of anything else, not just the colonial, because of course also there were other uh, political forces going on. In many ways, I mean, if you think of the history of Shiism, uh, it's a bit this as well. Shiism is a form of Islam of a, of a defeated state, with a hope it will come back, uh, setting up a kind of um, hide and seek game between the state, uh, making, making it terribly uncomfortable when in a situation like in Iran, for example, uh, it suddenly becomes a state, but it really uh, causes endless ambiguities, uh, which, of course, a contemporary and a well-known, uh, even to the extent that Mr. Amanijad, oh, I'm pronouncing it properly, uh, sort of sees his destiny, uh, the collapse of the political, uh, which is, of course, completely within the logic of what I'm talking about. So we're dealing with something which, in fact, is contemporary with us, the kind of what happens when uh, we're getting religion. And what I'm arguing, uh, I've never been so bold as to say it as crudely as I have to going to say it now, is that I think that is where we have the origin of religion, in the collapse of states, uh, religion as a distinct phenomenon. And uh, one way of illustrating this, or which I, I, I want to use, is what one finds on the west coast of Madagascar. I'm sorry to bring you back to Madagascar, but if only you knew enough about Madagascar, you wouldn't be able to study anywhere else in the world. You'd think you would see in by far the most interesting place in the world. Now, the west coast of Madagascar it is famous in the anthropological literature, at least, as a place where spirit possession linked to the state is highly developed, something rather similar to what we find in certain parts of East Africa, like the Shona areas as well. What happens there is that in the past, they were fairly efficient kingdoms, very impermanent, because kingdoms are. Um, but to a certain extent, they're also permanent. Because the ancient rulers, uh, the dead rulers, possess mediums at near, who are involved in rituals linked with their remains uh, kept in shrines. But above all, these, rich, these, these dead rulers um, possess um, people, uh, non-royals usually. Uh, and once the possession is established, uh, the places where these, these possessed people are become kinds of ghostly capitals. Ghostly capitals in the sense that it is spirits possessing rulers who are the rulers. So instead of, if you like, a live state, you're having a dead state continuing as I say, a bit like the Catholic Church. Um, it 
it's quite interesting to sort of think in terms of the experiential character of this, this type of possession. I won't go into great detail about the possession, but like all possession, it's in a funny way double. That is that the mediums experience the spirits wanting to come into them. The typical possession story is that someone falls ill. They interpret their illness as the spirit wanting to come to them. So it's from the outside coming in. Uh, and then after a number of rituals, a number of arrangements with other experts who can certify that this is indeed uh, the, the, the suitable dead person. The medium allows herself, because it's mainly women, but not entirely, uh, to subject herself, to be conquered. This is exactly the words used. To be conquered by the, by the old rulers. And of course, as she becomes conquered, she becomes a ruler herself as she is possessed. Because she is, at least during the possession, the ruler. So, you know, she, she's conquered and conquers, and thereby creates a bit of that organic hierarchical system of submission um, to, to other people. Michael Lambeck, who's described this, uh, talks about it as a kind of history. I'm not quite sure. I, I, I'm not at all convinced that it's a kind of history because I don't think one would sort of say, supposing uh, that Charlemagne possessed one of you and came to talk to us, it would be Charlemagne who came to talk to us, we would just call that history. It would be Charlemagne coming to us. But still, what he means is quite clear, that it's a kind of drama of the history of those past kingdoms which one can sort of see interacting uh, in front of us. And there's a, another very, very interesting and detailed study of these phenomena. There have been quite a few, because of course this dominates the whole of the west of Madagascar. We're talking about millions of people who spend so much of their resources on um, the rituals involved with this. Um, what's interesting is the essential, uh, and this is very much stressed in the other study by an anthropo American anthropologist called Gillian Feely Harnick, whose work you perhaps know, some of you, uh, who's also studied the similar sort of phenomena. And she particularly studies the great rituals of um, the great rituals associated with these possessed, uh, these mediums possessed by rulers. And what's very striking, what is one of the things that's very striking to me, is that it involves thousands of people giving up lots of their resources to become subjects, to become kneelers, to become prostrate in front of these rulers who exist as they have come into the body of the mediums. It's as though the whole kingdom, which in the past presumably um, was um, actual kingdoms, well, we know, not presumably, we know quite a lot historically about these kingdoms, uh, continued with the dead. And this is a point which Filiharnik stresses because she argues in a way which I think <coughs> I find very convincing that one can understand this development 
which of course the early anthropologists described as some sort of primitive religion, uh, an example, you know, spirit possession kind of thing. Metro Goldwyn Mayer loves, you know, sort of you fall down, float with the mouse, all sorts of things. Uh, it's good, good for cinema. She she argues quite convincingly to me that in a sense this pushing of the kingdom onto the dead is very much linked with the imposition of colonial power. In other words, of the, uh, of the rulers actually losing uh, their political power, first of all to the mariner and then of course to the French. In a sense, you see, you're seeing a, repro a reproduction of the pattern that I was talking about when I was talking about the mariner that as the kingdom centralizes, as the ruler becomes the house, as he becomes the andri, the, the, the central post, the andri uh, of, the, of the kingdom, and therefore pushes ever further down into the organic hierarchical structure, the subjects, they uh, their rulers, their, the heads of their families, uh, become the dead, or at least, if you like, the supernatural. In other words, it creates really a category of the supernatural in relationship to this political system. And I think one, one, it would be very interesting to find this kind of thing again and again. Another very interesting example is the Shona kingdoms uh, of Zimbabwe, uh, Mozambique, where very, very similar patterns uh, occur uh, with mediums being possessed by rulers of, a king, uh, of an empire which existed about 200 years ago, but which can still be seen to exist bit like the Catholic Church in the sense of the administrative centers, the bureaucratic structure of the, em uh, of the empire is continuing in the locations of the places where the mediums are possessed by the ancient rulers. Um, a kind of, you know, a kind of religion, a dead state as religion but not politically inactive. Because in the book by David Lang, which I don't know if you know, called Guns and Rain, which is a precisely about that, he shows how during um, the war against the Rhodesians, Mugabe formed a very close alliance uh, with these spirit mediums. Uh, indeed, he argues, he, he argues very convincingly that when Mugabe first tried to overthrow the Rhodesian regime, uh, he, he came you know, with a sort of strong secularist line, which he got very largely in China uh, and with um, Soviet trainers outside Zimbabwe. And he got absolutely nowhere. And he quite consciously came back uh, with this alliance with the spirit mediums. Uh, in other words, it's as though the spirit mediums were taking over the state again. But, of course, Mugabe, <laughs> that's the last thing Mugabe wanted. And the subsequent history of his relationship with the spirit medium has been one of hostility, not to mention of murderous, uh, 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 of murderous suppression. One can begin to see the kind of hide and seek that I'm talking about between the state and something that is beginning to look uh, like religion uh, in a very, very similar way to the kind of interaction between the political and the religious uh, that uh, one finds on the west coast of Madagascar. Now, all these are systems which are interesting in that um, they 
It's as though the prestige of the old political system, even transformed, taken out of the, uh, of the transactional, having become a matter of the dead or of gods or of spirits or something like that, um, is what explains what follows on. But I think also interesting is that in many places, and at least for many people, that prestige just doesn't work. And then we get a completely different form of spirit possession, which I think one can still interpret within the kind of framework that I'm talking about. I'm going to give you the example of czar possession, uh, which, uh, because it's so well described uh, and analyzed in the book by Jenny's body uh, for, for the Sudan, but of course the kind of possession which is characteristic of much of the Islamic wor world, you find that sort of thing in Madagascar as well, uh, is found in many, many parts of Africa, uh, Morocco, and so on. There one finds something much more disorganized. Uh, something much more focused on women, though I think one shouldn't too much emphasize the fact that it's focused on women because, of course, although the mediums are women, the clients are not necessarily women. Um, and uh, therefore, um, and the reason why the, 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 why the, why the mediums are likely to be women uh, seems to be very well explained by Jenny's body with ideas about the body and the ability uh, 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 and their body to be dangerously open to other forces uh, and with obviously a sexual overtone. But one of the things that I want, want to stress here is that who are the spirits? They're not predictable like the Sekalava spirits. Uh, the, or the Shona spirits, they're more or less anybody. Not quite anybody. They're all powerful, powerful characters of some sort or other. She gives us quite a nice list of these spirits. You get um, the Sudan, of course, was, was uh, jointly governed as a colony by Egypt and Britain. So you get Egyptian and British colonial administrators coming as spirits possessing, um, possessing um, Sudanese women. You get Ethiopian rulers from the past possessing, uh, uh, possessing um, Sudanese women. You get Rich merchants, sort of rich Lebanese and Europeans, Europeans of all kind, football stars nowadays, I understand, uh, since, you know, obviously we're still talking about all, uh, really almost any rag bag of powerful characters. And what one feels, it's as though with these, it's as though, I mean, we, we shouldn't talk in terms of the women seeking the spirits, um, because of course it's in terms of the spirits seeking the women that the whole thing is experienced. But it's as though any old political um, force, so long as it's not instantiated in actual people, is trying to possess, um, is trying to possess Sudanese women at the time, at least when she was writing, or if you like, putting it the other way around. It's these Sudanese women welcoming these dangerous military aggressors, uh, whom, of course, once they're possessed, 
They begin to behave in sort of swashbuckling ways, drinking gin. And uh, similar also in Thai, in, in, I was remembering, in, in Thai possession, one gets much the same sort of thing. Uh, one of my experiences uh, with, with the woman being possessed by a Thai prince from past the long, so I sort of went to, went to see her. And there was this old, wizened old women, woman sitting there. Uh, and then, you know, a bit of drumming. She became possessed by her prince. She got it all right, you know, to do the whole thing had been uh, absolutely regulated. It wasn't like the first possessions, which are chaotic. The later possessions are well organized. And suddenly, this woman got up, picked up a sword, and started to. And she cut down, she cut my shirt here. Uh, and you know, I just couldn't believe that she could have the strength to do this. It just sort of shows you the kind of situation one is dealing with. So, as I say, the way to understand what's going on there, uh, am I going on too long? Yeah, I am, aren't I? Uh, I just sort of, um, is, is this kind of chase between, if you like, religion and power, uh, which uh, I'm going to go and follow next week. But there's one final element which I'd like to consider to conclude. And that is, it seems to me, the element which Lambeck or Fili Harnik, when they're talking about um, Sakalava possession, play down, while in my experience it's absolutely central. And that is that the people who go, apart from the great rituals, who go to these spirits are going there to be cured, to be cured of disease, disease in the term of it being, uh, as I think it's understood in many parts of the world, as not necessarily uh, Physical, you know, disease can be because you have terrible stomach ache, you're too thin, or your wife quarrels all the time, your children uh, have gone off to Europe and never write to you. This is all the same sorts of phenomena, and those are the kind of phenomena to which you go to um, a medium. So imagine. A Sekalava medium, you go to them because you've got trouble. You recognize their power. You become a subject, usually very importantly by giving a coin, which uh, something which is quite interesting in Madagascar, the giving of a particular coin is a sign of inferiority of the deference towards the ruler. Uh, therefore, you become, you defer to the spirit. And the spirit, if you give it enough things, some of these spirits are sort of pretty voracious. They, they like uh, the ones Michael Lambeck talks about. They love eau de cologne, uh, so much so that they drink it. Um, they, they want presents and all sorts of things. But you, the point is that you're placing yourself as a subject. And with luck, you're cured if the spirit has accepted you. So why should that be? Why should, you know, I've been talking in political terms, why should suddenly curing uh, come into this story? And I think the answer is not so difficult to, 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 to find. If we remember why the rituals, for example, in a Zafimaniri village or a place like that, are done. By and large, not entirely. By and, and of course, these are the moments when the imaginary is given life and timelessness. Uh, well, when are they done? 
to put things right. Very often, uh, again, because of disease in the sense that I've used it, or because of a promise to the dead which hasn't been properly fulfilled, something like that. Uh, which, of course, all these faults are manifested in diseases. And one reestablishes through submission, through acts of submission, the acts typical of religion, uh, as well as the acts typical of the political, the kind of organic, time-defying order um, that has been characterizing the transcendental as I've been talking about it. So the answer of why uh, one wants to carry on kingdoms after they've died is because one is seeking a place in an organic system. Otherwise, one's like a chimpanzee. Remember, chimpanzees only have the transactional, as I was talking about. Them. There's absolutely no continuity. They haven't in any way vanquished time. They haven't vanquished the transform, transform, transformability of, of, uh, uh, of existence, which come from, comes from our organic nature, not to mention the, 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 the continual transactions between individuals. One is really in danger of being nothing. Uh, and how does one overcome this? By kneeling down, as Pascal would have said. Uh, and then, I don't know if you know Pascal, but uh, Pascal is sort of a, a French Catholic philosopher, uh, as well as a mathematician. I think he came up with this wonderful theory about religion. He, was, he, was a, he thought it was a good idea, uh, Catholicism, but of a special form. And he said, look, don't bother about what you believe. Just kneel down, and then that will all come. And that's rather similar, I think, to the people who come to these spirit mediums that I've been talking about. Right.